that we heard what Paul had to say to the Romans, what does he say to the Corinthians? That's what we're going to find out today in 1 Corinthians 1. So we are on to our seventh book of the Bible. Yay, we're starting to make some progress here. Now, if we remember all the way back to Acts, Corinth was this place that was wild, very sinful. And in fact, when you called someone a Corinthian, it was a slam towards them. It was a a cut towards them because they had wealth and they had good jobs because Corinth is in this very thin neck area that ended up being a huge transportation hub, not terribly far away from Athens. So it was a wealthy enough place, you know, good jobs and things like that, but they lived very wickedly. Athens was considered intellectual, highbrow, were thinkers, and the great philosophers, of course, of, of Western civilization live. But in this particular case, it was a, certainly a smaller city. At the time of Paul, they thought that maybe Corinth had about 200,000 people. It was about 3.5 miles over land if you wanted to get to Athens. And it was right there at the Aegean Sea, again, a big port harbor. But now Paul is writing, as he typically does, to talk about problems. He's a problem-solving guy, right? Romans was having problems probably between the Jewish community and the Gentile community. In this particular case, we're having a moral problem in this particular land. And so we're going to find out now exactly what it is he had to say to Corinth. And so we kick off with Paul saying and identifying himself and giving his greetings to them. But Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. So again, this is ESV. That's what I do my own Bible study in. And he says to the church in Corinth, thank those sanctified in Christ. And sanctified, again, is sort of set apart for holiness, called to be saints. And, and he's saying that we're all together in this. We're all a part of it. We are called saints. It's interesting because I always think about that word saint, where our saints, the apostles, are the saints now, you know, we think of it in the Catholic Church, people are given sainthood. But he is writing that everyone, that they're together in sainthood. And he says, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is also a very common opening to church services. So he says that he gives thanks for them, you know, because of the grace that God gave to them. You know, that they've been allowed to, you know, make this church and that the mission of Jesus has been brought to them. They have been saved just like the Jewish people have been saved because through this church. It says that you're not lacking in any gift. You know, meaning this is probably a very talented group of people. They have what they need to be a successful church community. They were very wealthy as a community, not just spiritual gifts, but just gifts of of earthly things too. There were banking jobs. This was a very well-to-do area of Greece. He hopes that it will stain them to the end, guiltless for the day of the Lord. You know, going to be the final wheat and the chaff and the goats and the, and the sheep kind of thing. That God is faithful to all of us. They're called through Jesus Christ, just like we're called through Jesus Christ too. So this is kind of to all of us. And he's appealing to them now. He says, you know, in the name of of Jesus Christ. All of you agree that we believe in Jesus. There should be no divisions among us, that we should be united, same mind. And there have been reports by Chloe that people are quarreling. There's fighting going on. So I think in the case of the Gentiles and the Jews in Rome, it didn't sound like fighting. It sounded like, eh, you know, separation. In this case, they're actually fighting. And he says, you know, some people follow Paul. It's going to be him. Some follow Paul. Apollos, that's that guy we learned about who was very excited, but he didn't have enough learning about the baptism. He, you know, he learned about Jesus and he never heard of the baptism of John and Priscilla and Aquila helped him on that. Or follow Cephas. Who's Cephas? Another name for Peter. Peter has a lot of names. Or are you just going to follow Jesus? Christ is not divided up into little groups. It's not supposed to be divisions like this. 
I wasn't, you know, he's saying, I'm not crucified for you. You're not baptized in my name. And in fact, he's glad that he didn't baptize that many of you because then people probably would go around boasting like, oh, Paul baptized me. He doesn't want that to happen. He wants people to realize they're baptized into Christ, that they're preaching the gospel of Jesus, not they're preaching the words of any particular person, including him. Ooh, tough area, right? The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. You know, for people who don't believe, people who won't accept the word, it, 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 it is it's foolishness, but they are perishing. They are wilting on the vine. And it's not to us because we are people that are baptized into Christ. We are saved through the power of God. And he even mentions that the wisdom of the wise is going to be destroyed. But who is really wise? We think, you know, too, in our own times that at times people will call Christians, I guess, hicks or uneducated or unknowledgeable. But what is the thing that matters the most? The thing that matters the most is knowledge of God, wisdom of God, so that we understand what it is that is pleasing to God, folly to God, that we understand Jesus is crucified for us. And it's going to be a stumbling block, he mentions particularly to the Jews, but then also folly to the Gentiles. They're just not accepting any of this. Think about, too, you know, he went again on Mars Hill in the book of Acts and preached the word of God. And people were like, yeah, okay, well, cool idea. And then walked off. Folly to them. They weren't even accepting it. So no one is pure in this whole piece of it. And they call it a stumbling block to the Jews. Why it's not folly is because the Jewish people believe in God. That's the thing. They believe in the God who rumbled the mountains, who created the earth, who created the heavens, who did all this thing, and they couldn't see Jesus in that. They didn't see the Messiah that had been promised to them since the beginning of time to save from the sin they couldn't see it into them. So it's stumbling them. It's, it's causing them to fall because they just are failing in their own faith by not seeing Jesus as who he is. For those who are called Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, whoever it is, we have the power of God, the wisdom of God, and we're all brothers in this. But many of you are not wise. Uh oh. So they have. The power, the saving power of grace of God. You're my brothers. And people are going to think of you as not wise. You know, probably the people of Athens, particularly, are going to think that this is like, you know, trashy people, not wise, not like us in Athens who are educated and smart and have these amazing, you know, philosophers of time. But instead, even though you're not noble birth, you have been brought here to shame the wise. Your ability to see God's truth will shame those people who consider themselves smarter than you are. But reminds them, too, that you're not supposed to be boasting because God doesn't want us to be prideful and boast. All of this is because of God. All of this is because of Jesus Christ. The wisdom came from God. We knew that from the very beginning. And everything, all of it, comes from God. The only one who has the right to boast is the Lord himself. And that ends chapter one of 1 Corinthians. What I'm going to meditate on this week is the fact that even though Corinth had this terrible reputation and people looked down on them, and we're going to find out why their reputation was so bad coming up in chapters, God was still using them as folly to these supposed wise men, as stumbling blocks to people who couldn't see Jesus through their own faith. They were still part of God's plan, even though we're going to find out they have problems. What I'm going to pray about is that I always keep that in mind, that when you feel put down by the rest of the world, we understand it is God's wisdom, it is God's word that is the standard for everything that's out there. And so if we feel like we're being dismissed from everything in the world, that is all that matters is God's word. What I'm going to share with others is the fact that God doesn't look at things the way we look at things. You know, we'll see someone and they're rich or they're smart or they're beautiful or they're powerful or this is Athens and that's Corinth. 
God doesn't look at things like that. God sees through all of it and sees who we are as individuals and in those cases uses us to become folly or stumbling block to people who actually really need to see the word of God. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. I appreciate you starting off book six with me. This is going to be a fun adventure. I'm excited we're getting into another letter of Paul because we're going to see a contrast that he's not just writing the same thing group to group to group, but instead he is personalizing his message to the group and telling them what they need to hear. So please remember that you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear from you. And if you want me to speak at your Bible study, would like to drop me an email and tell me what's going on with your own personal worship or Bible study that you're doing, I'd love to hear it. Again, I do these podcasts on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which means the other days you read the chapters in between. So today we're doing 1 Corinthians 1. Tomorrow, then you would read 1 Corinthians 2. And then we would talk about that on the on Friday. See how that goes. So anyway, I appreciate you listening again. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful day. Mm-hmm.